If you have a Bible, go to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. If you don't have a copy of the scriptures, we're going to put the text up on the screen so you can follow along with us. But we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26. We're going to work through quite a bit of scripture today, but um, we'll, we'll read through that together. If you were here last week, uh, you heard Ty talk about, Tyler talk about um, the, just loving uh, in, in under, under pressure and, and in life there's trouble that comes comes at us and what it looks like to love when trouble kind of comes at us and how love looks when, when it moves towards trouble. If you remember the illustration that he did, like, so, but that's what love does. It moves, moves towards uh, trouble. If, if, you, if you missed last week, I would just strongly recommend you go back and, and listen to it on uh, redemptionaz.com. It's our website. You can see uh, messages that we, maybe you've missed in the past. And especially if you've missed where we've been with this series, um, it'd be a great, great idea for you to go and to, to, to look at that. But, but this week, we're going we're gonna to look at, well, what about when there's the pressure of someone's betrayal or treachery towards me? It's one thing when there's just trouble in life, like trouble just kind of comes up at me. But what about trying to love someone who's betrayed me or, or, or has been treacherous towards me? Because there is this reality in life that sometimes people who you'd think they'll never let me down, or at least they shouldn't let me down, will let you down. Now, Preachers are not supposed to start their messages with huge downers like this. Uh, I realize that. Um, but that's where we're going to be going in the, in the text uh, this morning. I'm going to pray for us before we get into our text. And I want to pray something really specific. And maybe this is just for me, but I tend to think maybe not. Maybe it's for all of us. But um, you ever realize that sometimes you're just so busy that you just end up in a place and you're like, how did I even get here? I just, man, that week flew by, the morning flew by, time is just flying by. And I'm like, I, I'm here, you know, physically, but I'm not here mentally or spiritually. And so I'm going to ask God to really help us just to be present. Um, because I just feel like, for me personally, I just can get so busy and so just kind of always running, always running, always running that I'm not really paying attention to the presence of God. And I, and I want us, all of us, to experience that this morning. And uh, I believe we have to ask God to help us with that. And so uh, let, let's pray and, and ask God to help us. Father, I, I thank you so much for the opportunity that we have. God, it's not an obligation for, for us. It's an, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity that's a, that's a gift that you provide for us. God, to give us time and space like this. God, to be led uh, by people and, and singing and in worship that you've given ability and talent and giftedness. And, and God, now this opportunity to freely open your word and to see what you have to say to us. And Father, I just have to confess, and, and maybe it's our corporate confession as well, that God, there's a, there's a busyness in our heads, in our minds, in our hearts even. And God, there's distractions. Maybe it's distractions that are outside the walls of this church. We're, we're thinking about all the things we have to do once we leave. Or God, maybe there are the distractions with our watch or our phone. Or, and God, I just pray that you would um, that you'd bring a peace to us this morning. God, a peace that allows us to focus on you. God, a, a peace that allows us to be present to your presence. And Holy Spirit, would you come? And would you just give us a, an awareness of you, God, today? Would you calm our anxious hearts? God, let us hear you above all the noise of everything else. God, let us see you. Jesus, um. This is always and only about you. And so I just pray that our hearts and our love for you is stirred up, that there's, a, there's an affection for you that's stirred up today. And pray these things in your name. Amen. Matthew chapter 26. So Jesus and his followers have left uh, the upper room where they have ha celebrated Passover with the Last Supper. And we find them in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36. They're now moving into a garden um, where Jesus will pray. The garden's called Gethsemane. And he brings his followers. He says, sit here while I go over there and pray. In verse 37, he took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled, the scripture said. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. So stay here and keep watch with me. 
I don't know if, it, know if you've ever had a, a long night before there was something the next morning that you had to do that was really difficult, or if you ever had a, a season or a time where you just knew the next thing I have to do is going to be a very difficult thing. But Jesus is there, and here in the garden, the agony not only of an impending death, but, but, but the death of all deaths is coming. The shame of all shame, the curse of God is coming. And what started with Adam and his rebellion in the Garden of Eden takes us here to another garden with the second Adam. And the curse of sin is about to be remedied, but it will be through agony, through shame. All the shame of our sin, all the agony and the penalty of death will be placed on Christ. And he knows that that hour is drawing near for him. Look at verse 39. Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. This is not the point of the message, but it's a, a great point in this message, is that the way to deal with the impending struggle and the pain of this life, the things that we know will inevitably give way, Jesus teaches us here is to submit to the will of God, meaning to submit, to put my life under the plan and the purpose of God through prayer. Jesus models that all through his ministry. It's critical here in this critical moment. And Jesus models for us how we are to respond in our moments of agony. It's so easy for us to dismiss the story because we look at the divine nature of, of Jesus. And maybe you're, you're, you're so familiar with what we're going to be reading this morning that you just kind of glaze over it and, and, and you can overlook the humanity of Jesus. This is the mystery of Jesus, that he's, that he's fully God and, and, and fully man. The theologians refer to this as the hypostatic union. Tyler's not the only one who knows big words, by the way. The difference is he actually knows what they all mean. So, But this is the mystery of Jesus, these, these two natures that are in complete harmony with one another. And he demonstrates here the full humanity in his garden. He knew what was to come because of his divine understanding, but he bore the weight of it in his human flesh. We have to be careful because I think a lot of times we just think of Jesus as like Superman in a Clark Kent suit. That's not who he is. He's man, and it's powerfully demonstrated here. He's bearing all the struggle. He's bearing all the sorrow, all the pain here. Verse 40, he comes back to his disciples, his closest followers, and he finds them sleeping. And he says, couldn't you men keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away a second time and he prayed, My father, if it's not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. And he came back and again he found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. And so he left them and went away once more and prayed the third time, saying the same thing. And then he returned to the disciples and he said to them, Are, st are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. I was looking at this this week, and I, and I had this thought. I said, like, why didn't the disciples leave these verses out? Like, like, when you're writing this, why did they include themselves sleeping on the job? And I think it's because we learned something very important about Jesus here in the, in the failure of the disciples, that even while we fail, Jesus intercedes on our behalf. Romans chapter 8, verse 34, Paul, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, and more than that, who was raised, who's at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. We're gonna, we see later in the, in the Passion account that, that while on the cross, while Jesus is hanging on the cross, shredded on the cross, and below him, they're, they're gambling. They're, they're, they're gambling for his garments. And what does he do there? He prays, Father, forgive them. Even as you are failing, even in your failure, Jesus is praying and interceding for you. I, lo I love that, that song we, we, ju we just sang. The, the cross of Christ is ever pleading for me. 
If you're not a Christian in the room, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're just here kind of checking this out, or maybe somebody invited you, and your notion of Christians is that, like, those are the people who feel like they do better than everybody else, like they've got it all figured out. Like, those are the people who are really depending on them doing all the good things, all the right things. You're really missing the boat on what it is to be a follower of Jesus. We come here, and we gather, and we sing these songs, and we, we, we lock arms with, with, really, with one anthem. Christ, it's your cross. I have nothing else to bring. I, I, I have no other case to make. I cannot bring this pile of good activity. I can only come and plead the cross. And that cross intercedes on our behalf. Verse 46, rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer, Jesus says. And while he was still speaking, Judas, so Judas is one of the closest followers of Jesus, one of the twelve, arrived, and with him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, and he sent the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. He says, the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, teacher. And he kissed him. And Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. And then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. And with that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Jesus says, put your sword back. <laughs> for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call my, on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? And in that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, Am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Jesus got arrested Anybody identify with that? Je Jesus got arrested, which means in the, in the human court of law on planet Earth, he has a criminal record. Jesus can identify with the fabric of human life. Don't miss the humanity of Jesus in this. As, as I was looking through this whole scene I this weekend, as I was reading it over and over, I was really trying to just see it fresh and, and really trying to put myself in it because the scene, this whole scene for me, is just really crazy. In, in, in the book of John, in John's account, he says that when they come to arrest Jesus, he says to them, who are you looking for? And they say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. And when he says that, everybody gets blown back and they fall on the ground. He says, I, I am he, in the Greek is ego and me. And that's when they knew they were going to kill him, by the way, because he, he called himself Yahweh. But, but it means to exist. It's the verb to, to, to be. So he says, I, I, I be God. And when he said it, it knocked him over. Now, here's a, little, here's a little tip, especially if you're in law enforcement. If you ever go to arrest somebody and they tell you their name and it knocks you over to the ground, you might want to think a little bit about who it is that you're actually arresting. So that's one thing. And then Peter, Peter, if you're not familiar with Peter, you should study Peter in the scriptures. He's amazing. Peter takes out his sword, swings on Malchus. We, we have his, his name um, because some commentators think that Malchus actually became, became a Christian. I'll tell you why in a second. That he swings on Malchus, chops off his ear. And, and Jesus is like, Peter, please. And he, and he, and he goes and, he, and Luke tells us he touches Malchus's ear and heals it. Now, again, if you go to arrest a man and one of the people that you came with to arrest this man gets his ear lopped off and then the man you're trying to arrest heals that ear, I'm, just consider who it is that you are actually arresting. I love this. I, I was thinking about Malchus. I was like, I wonder what he's doing the rest of the night. If he's like, hey, does it look all right? Is it on? Is it on? Is it on straight? Did he, is it still there? Did it really happen? Right? In this garden, the rebel seeks out Jesus to attack him, and Jesus heals them. They mean to do him harm. They intend to attack, but he doesn't run, and he doesn't attack them. He is not threatened or shocked by your betrayal, by your rebellion, by your doubt, by your aggression. 
your clubs and your swords do not threaten Jesus. So don't think that Jesus can't handle your failure. Don't think that Jesus can't handle your anger, your doubt, your rebellion, your betrayal. He isn't threatened. He isn't shocked. He isn't afraid because he's already bore the punishment, the shame, the guilt, and the pain. He's already covered it. You see, for Jesus, it wasn't so much that he was arrested as it was that he was surrendered. You can't arrest the Son of God. He has to surrender. There's two things, briefly, I think, that that we pull out of this Passion account. And there, there are two questions, really. What does the heart of Christ look like in the midst of betrayal and rebellion and sin and treachery and folly? What does the heart of Christ look like? And then the question for for you is, as you deal with that in your own life, how do you respond to that? How how do you respond against betrayal, rebellion, treachery, the folly of sin against yourself? We we see clearly how Jesus responds. He loves them. Judas comes to kiss him, and the the word there is is love. He comes to love him. It's the, it's the, the word love that's synonymous with kiss. So it's an act of love to betray the king of love. Now think about that. His own disciple comes to him and he's going to hand him over with a kiss. What a a mockery it is. In in Luke, Jesus asks the question, he says, Judas, you you betray me with with a kiss? Really? And, And some people think that Jesus was confronting Judas there. I think what Jesus is saying, Judas... They're going to arrest me anyway. And and I fully accept that it's going to happen. Don't make a mockery out of my love for you with a kiss. Don't kiss me. Embrace me. Jesus is still extending love towards Judas. We've all in this series, we've been really trying to slow down and actually see Jesus, like see the person of Jesus in these different places and people and accounts and, and, and scenes that he's in. And I, and I just, I thought about that as I, as I thought of Jesus seeing Judas come through. As the, as the torches light his face, what does the face of Jesus look like towards Judas? Is, does he have this, oh, you're going to get yours, Judas. Vengeance is mine. I don't know if you've heard that before. Or does he have a face of compassion? Like in his eyes, does he have compassion? Like we've seen him all throughout the gospel narratives. It's, it's easy for us to hate Judas. And when we find out later that is, he hangs himself, we almost, almost kind of inwardly applaud at that moment. I mean, he's the villain after all. He's the bad guy. It's tragic. I, I, I tried to put myself in, in the position of, of, of Judas reading through this this weekend, and asking myself the question, have, have you ever been deceived by your own selfishness and, and greed? H- has your own selfishness and greed taken you to places where you've done irrational things that you wish you could take back? H- have you ever been under so much guilt that you just didn't know, you couldn't, you couldn't figure out a way out? In, in, in Judas's story, there is this kind of irrational behavior. He's running back, he throws the money back hangs himself. Have you, ever had, have you ever been covered in guilt like that? It, it is so hard to love people in your life at the point of their treachery against you. It is so difficult to love people in your life at the point of their infidelity, their sin, their wrongdoing against you. In fact, you want to use their wrongdoing against them as the reason why you won't love them. I would love you, but I would love you, but you betrayed me. But under the grace of Jesus, their sin is the reason to love them. Because at the point of your sin, God loved you. So at the point of their sin, you love them. That's the pressure of love. As a pastor, one of the most frustrating things for me is, is, my, own, is my own sin. It's my own sin, and I feel like I'm just constantly confronted with it, and I'm constantly just frustrated by it. Like, seriously, again, you responded that way again, you did that again, you thought that way again. And so when I'm reading this, and, and I was reading through this this, this weekend, all the, all the failures, all the, all the mess in it, I just felt it like constantly like just bothering me. 
betrayal, selfishness. At, at the Last Supper, Jesus is talking about his death, and his closest followers, his closest friends are sitting around talking about, I wonder which one of us is the greatest. There, there's laziness, they're sleeping on the job, there's vi violence. Peter is chopping people's ears off. And, and in a moment, we're going to see his denial. It's a mess. It's all a mess. And so am I. And so are you. But Jesus doesn't react in anger or frustration. He leads out of and in love. He's, he calls Judas friend. It's a greeting of, of, of love. T to Peter, there's this correction. And it's a correction that says, Peter, put the sword away. Because if you, if, you, if you live out of violence, you'll always be surrounded by violence. You'll have a violent life. Put it away. T to Malchus, he says, here, he's, there's healing. He says, here you go. You can, now you can hear again. It's an amazing portrait of the love of God. He continues to love them in the midst of their own violence and foolishness and treachery. He's the one who says, look, no more of this. He continues to lead the crowd. He won't let the sin and the folly and the foolishness of everybody stop his leadership, even as he's headed towards his execution, his crucifixion. He's always loving and always leading in this procession. Jesus is taken from the garden all the disciples split. He's taken before the high priest where he's questioned, he's mocked, he's beat, they strike him, they, they spit on him. There's human men spit on the face of God. The, the face that called forth the universe has human spit on it. Have you ever been spit on? Has anyone ever spit on your face? They spit on Jesus. In, 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 in preaching collective, and I, I found myself um, here at this spot. I didn't say this earlier today, but I'm struck with it right now. In preaching collective, um, Aaron Daly, who's the lead pastor at Alhambra, or one of the lead pastors at Alhambra, he was talking about when he went to see uh, The Passion of the Christ, the movie, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. And we were talking about just this whole scene. We were talking about just the passion scene and all these things that were happening. And he said that in the, while he was watching that movie, he's watching Jesus be whipped and beat and all these things are happening. He said, in the theater, I just felt myself cry out, stop, stop it. And I was... Uh, reading through it. This is probably why I didn't bring this up earlier today. When I was reading through it in, um, in Starbucks <laughs> on Friday, I was weeping over it and just thinking the same thing. Just stop. Just stop it. All this is going on. Peter, who is the sword swinging, I'll never let them kill you, Jesus disciple, is hiding around a fire outside in a courtyard listening to what's going on. Verse 69 says this, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and the servant girl came to him. You also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. And then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again. It goes a level up with an oath. I don't know the man. And after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you're one of them. Your accent gives it away. We got you. <laughs> then he began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. And immediately, a rooster crowed. And then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken, Before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside, and he wept bitterly. I, I think there's something that's really significant about the, the bitter tears. Um, Luke, in his gospel, he, he tells us that Jesus actually looks at Peter after the denial. Now again, if we want to slow down and we want to see the face of Jesus, what do you think the face of Jesus looked like as he looked at Peter? What do you think were in the eyes of Jesus as he locked eyes with Peter? Why did, why did Peter weep bitterly? Was it because he was just embarrassed? 
because he got caught, because he was busted? I don't think so. I think it's deeper than that. I think it's because what happened in that moment is that everything that Peter was and everything that he had committed his life to, he felt like he had just thrown it all away. Again, Peter, he's one of the most loyal people to Jesus. Peter was the one who was called out of the boat onto the water. P- Peter, was, Peter was the one who was given a, a, a new name. He was given hope and future, a destiny that was changed forever. He was given a new purpose. Peter was recast from this unknown Galilean fisherman to, to one of the closest followers of the Messiah. As Jesus is walking around and he's healing and he's teaching and he's loving people, he's starting this kind of cultural revolution. Peter is at the very epicenter of what that is. He's right there. There's a moment, we talked about it actually a few weeks ago, where there's a moment where Jesus has done this very difficult teaching and people are like, well, I, I can't handle that. And they all leave and everybody, everybody splits. There were thousands that were following Jesus and they all leave. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he says, what about you guys? Are you out too? And it's Peter. Peter's the one who steps up and he says, to whom will we go? You have the very words of life. Peter says, Jesus, there's no other option. There's no other option for me. Where would we possibly go? You have the words of life. So when we see him a few hours later, denying that he even knew Jesus to this teenage girl, that's what the bitter tears are all about. Bitter tears are the ones that you taste in your failure. But bitter tears are the ones that you taste when you know I did not hold up my end of the commitment. Bitter tears are the ones that you taste when you say to yourself again and again, how could I? How could I have done that? How, how could I? I, I? I think there's beauty in Peter's denial. I love that it's in the Bible. You know, the gospel writers, they could have thrown Peter a bone. They're like, all right, dude, we, just, we won't put that in there, man. That's embarrassing. We won't put that in there. But I love that it's in there. It's amazing to have such a shameful event shape the beginning of the church because this breakdown taught Peter his absolute powerless. His denial and his weeping would be the best thing that would ever happen to him. In, in 1 Peter chapter 5, again, Peter is writing this. Listen to what he has to say. He says, in the same way you are younger, submit to your elders. All of you, all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because, and just imagine the shaky hand of Peter writing this. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. So humble yourselves that under God's mighty hand, he may lift you up in due time. And people who would have read Peter's letter would be like, oh, Peter, you know that. At, at the end of, of 2 Peter um, chapter 3, verse 15, the first part of 15, this Peter's closing his letter, he says this, bear in mind our Lord's patience means salvation. Peter understood the patience of Jesus. We, we see in Peter the reality of forgiveness and the love of Christ. I, I, again, if you're kind of new to understanding what Christians are, or you're, you would, you're just trying to figure out what are these people all about, they are, uh, Christians are failures. We are failures who have been forgiven. And whatever failures you have, the church is the people for you because we are beautiful narratives of the grace and forgiveness and love of Jesus Christ. And so when we gather together, it's not to pat ourselves on the back on how great we are. We gather together as massive failures who have been massively forgiven in Christ Jesus. There is beauty and faith and repentance in Peter's story. There's an author who talks about Judas versus Peter, and he says, A broken heart longs for forgiveness. A despairing heart thinks of only what it can do to make it better. Both hearts hit the bottom, but the broken heart realizes its powerlessness and cries out for God. The other tries half a dozen human remedies without relying on God's grace. There's a godly grief that produces repentance and a turning from our sin and our rebellion. And there's a worldly grief that leads only to despair. The last thing, and with this we end, there's Pilate, the governor. In Matthew chapter 27, so if you just flip one page over, Matthew chapter 27, verse 11, Jesus is there with Pilate, the governor. And the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? You've said so, replied Jesus. 
And when he accused the, when he was accused, this is Jesus, by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. But then Pilate asked him, look, don't you hear the testimony that they're bringing against him? Don't you hear what everybody's saying? Why don't you just tell them what they want to hear? Pilate's a politician. He's kind of used to that. He's like, look, here, take it from me. When people are giving you a hard time, just tell them what they want to hear. They'll get off your back. And Pilate's like, I do that all the time. Why don't you just do that? Why don't you just, why don't you just give up? Just say what they want to hear so it gets you out of it. Pilate, he, he tries to appease the crowd by offering up Barabbas. Barabbas is this notorious prisoner, sir, an insurrection. But the crowd chooses Jesus to be crucified. And this is how Pilate responds. Verse 24. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere. The, the, the author gives us great insight into the heart and mind of Peter. Or excuse me, Pilate. He's like, I'm just... This isn't working out for me. <laughs> I'm over it. I'm getting nowhere with this Jesus. But that instead an uproar was, was starting. He took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. He says, I'm innocent of this man's blood. It's your responsibility. And verse 25 is a harrowing verse because it says all the people shouted together, his blood is on us and our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. We're looking at how Jesus responds to our treachery and our betrayal and our sin. But I want to just take a second real quick. How, how do we respond to our own betrayal and our own treachery? Because I think, I think Judas and Peter and Pilate give us ways that we respond to our, our own treachery, our own betrayal. Some of us are, are like Judas, where we, we feel the guilt but we just move towards a destructive end. We're like, okay, it's all, I've already done it. It's already rebellion. It's already sin. I'm just going to keep kind of plowing through. We just get very irrational. We just keep kind of getting after it. Or we're defensive like Peter. We're very self-centered. There's denial. It's not me. It wasn't me. It's not me. Or we're deflective like Pilate. Just very dismissive, hard-hearted, we, 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 like Pilate, try to bend Jesus around our will, try to justify why it is that we have to do what we're doing. I, I, it's not my responsibility. It, a commentator, he talks about this, these, these passion scenes. He says, in these passion scenes, everyone passes by in a review of massive failure. And against this backdrop of human infidelity, we see the faithfulness of Jesus. In the midst of all this human failure... There was one who remains totally dependable. How does Jesus respond to our betrayal and our treachery? With love. Romans 5.8, God demonstrated his own love towards us in this. That while we were still, still sinners, Christ died for us. A lot of times we read that verse, we read it from our perspective, which that's great. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Think about that verse from God's perspective. While I was dying, you're still sinning. I'm on the cross. They're still mocking. There, there's, there's still ridicule. There's still gambling. There's still rebellion. While I died for you. In that place, Jesus meets our massive failures with his massively faithful love. This, um, this message was kind of tough for me because I, in fact, I told this to my wife last night right before I went to bed. I was reading her through the notes again. And I was like, you know, I, I love the Passion account, but this message really doesn't have a point. <laughs> And in fact, when we were in the preaching collective and we were all talking about it, we were kind of going around we're like, well, what's the point? Meaning like in the past, you know, we've had these messages, we'll give you an action item, here's something to do. Jesus loved this person like this. You love the outcast like that same way that he has loved. And we all kind of settled, and I love it actually, I think it's beautiful. We just really settled on, here's the point. We want you to see Jesus. We want you to see him. Like really, like really see him, like slow down, see Jesus. Because if you see him, 
if you see him, you'll be caught up in wonder. You'll be caught up in awe. Your love for him will grow. And your love for others will grow out of that. So let's just pray and ask God that he would help us to see him in the person of Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Again, God, I thank you for this time. I thank you most of all for Jesus. And Jesus, I thank you that you came and you lived the life that you did. And you endured. Jesus, we want to see you. We want to, we want to see you in the garden. We want to see you in the agony of your prayer. God, we want to see you sweating drops of blood. And Jesus, we want to see you when they come with the torches and the swords and the clubs. Jesus, we want to see you when you're met with betrayal. Jesus, we want to see you when you silence the violence and you bring healing. Jesus, we want to see you before the high priests and before Pilate. We want to see the humility and the confidence that you have in your Father as you're led, God, from beating to beating and the whippings and the floggings. Jesus, we want to see you as you carry your cross. We want to see you as you can't carry it any longer and Simon has to carry it. God, we want to see you as you're nailed to the cross. Jesus, we want to see you as you're lifted up, your body torn, broken, shredded, dehydrated, starving. Jesus, when I see you as, you as you pray for our forgiveness, and God, as we come to this moment of communion, help us to see you. Help us to know you. Help us to love you the way that you've loved us. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen.